So welcome to our discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on neurological charities. And um, this is just one of our initiatives for World Brain Day, which is coming up on the 22nd of July. Firstly, let me introduce myself. My name is Mags Rogers. I'm the Executive Director with the Neurological Alliance of Ireland, which is the national umbrella of over 30 neurological charities. Very pleased to be joined today by the CEOs of three neurological charities. If Peter Murphy, from the Irish Epilepsy Association, Ava Battles, CEO of the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Ireland, and Patrick Little from the Migraine Association of Ireland. I'd also like to welcome Deputy Jennifer Carol McNeil, Fine Gael TD for Dunleary, and member of the Joint Oireachtas Committee on COVID, who has very kindly agreed to join us for today's discussion. I'm going to ask each of the CEOs to comment very briefly on the impact of COVID-19 on their organization, organization's fundraising and sustainability. We're all very aware of the devastating impact on, on the sector. And um, I want to give each of the CEOs just a brief opportunity to outline for, for themselves how it's impacted on their own organization. So could I turn to you, Ava, first? OK, so MS Ireland receives approximately 50% of our funding from the state and our remaining funds come from fundraising donations and legacies. However, since the, I suppose, the last major crisis which we faced in 2008 and since then, we've been hit with a range of funding cuts and these have not been restored and they've undermined us, I suppose, in our bottom line. Then if you add to that the 1% cut that we have received in 2020, and this is all before you even think about the catastrophic impact that we have now had with COVID. So in relation to COVID, we've experienced a 37% drop in our fundraised income up to September of this year, which will be around 1.2 million euro. Okay, thank you, Ava. Could I move on to Peter then to give that brief excerpt? Thanks, Mags. So um, at Epilepsy Ireland, our, our typical budget is around 1.8 million a year, of which we need to raise about 800,000 for fundraising. That is used to supplement HSE and other state grants um, for support services and for our training, our advocacy, our awareness raising, and uh, our research funding. Uh, I suppose most of our fundraising at Epilepsy Ireland is uh, community and volunteer driven, and uh, I suppose because of COVID, that's been particularly badly affected. Um, our latest projections are that this year we'll only be able to raise about uh, in around 400,000 euros, which is about half of what we need for the year. Um, so we have we have been trying to protect our frontline services and support, um, and we've had to make some very difficult decisions, like um, postponing uh, our plans to fund to new epilepsy research this year. But even after all those measures, we're still looking at a, a very significant deficit for the year. Okay, thank you, Peter. And just finally moving on to Pat Little from the Migrant Association. Well, we're a much smaller uh, charity in terms of our um, income, it's around 250,000 a year. And about 60% of that would be state funding. Um, <clears throat> we are the only organization supporting people with migraine and headache, of whom there are over half a million people. And stress is one of the biggest contributory factors to migraine. And obviously, when the COVID thing kicked in, a whole range of things kicked off in terms of services being wiped out, basically, because people didn't have access to migraine clinics, even to GPs, all those kinds of things went instantly. And so there was a big surge in stress levels and a big increase in migraine. So we were left for the last number of months as being the only organization supporting people with migraine. Um, our funding. The rest of our funding comes from different sources, but face-to-face uh, -face events help us bring in, you know, a certain amount of fundraise funding that helps us balance the books. Um, industry, some of the corporate industry funds some of our events. So again, without those face-to-face -face events, that's a huge potential risk for the rest of the year. Um, and also we have a small amount of money that's fundraised from the general public. Again, you know, gone this year. So when, when this sustainability funding was announced, we couldn't actually justify bidding for it because we, we couldn't say we had 125% down at this point. But later in the year, it's potentially a serious issue because by then we know how bad it is. And I think 
I think I've given you, you all a very short opportunity there now to just talk about the, the, the impact on fundraising and sustainability. So I'm going to go back now and let each of you describe what that actually means in the short to medium term from your organization and some of the steps that your organization is having to take because of COVID-19. So maybe if I can move back to, to Ava and I'll come back to you, Pat, and, and, and let you expand a little bit more. Okay, so definitely, Carol, I'm not sure how much you know about MS Ireland. So just to give you the context, we're the only national organization that provides um, information support and advocacy services to the MS community. We operate in the 26 counties. We have one respite facility, which is a 12 bed respite facility in Dublin, where people come from all over the country. And then we have regional offices, which mirror the, um, the, H, the CHO areas. And then we have a network of 34 voluntary branches, which are people with MS themselves, family members, or carers who raise money locally for the provision of our services locally. So we are providing services that people references in the community. So I just like to reference the community piece for a second. So those 34 voluntary branches in 2018 or 2019, depending on the year, we, I don't have audit accounts for 2019, so I'm using 2018 figures for a fact. Sure. It's around a million euro. And that's through church gate collections, that's through bagpacking when you're in your Tesco or Supercren or wherever yeah. it is. And uh, church gate flag days, they're the three top earners. They raised a million euro and provided 980,000 worth of service into the community in wow. 20. Okay, so that is they raise money locally. That's extraordinary. Yeah, oh, it's incredible. So that is that's the value add example I would like to bring to the table. I suppose I yeah. can tell you our own fundraising and national and whichever. Yeah. So that's also the value add piece that's actually just forgotten about. And if you take, for example, the practicalities of that cohort of people who are cocooning currently, uh, you also take into account there are no church gate collections. There won't be bag packs at the end of your shopping for many months to come. So if I take that alone, yeah. I can take six months out of their fundraising. Straight away. It's, like it's gone, right? And then I'm being conservative when I said to you, I believe we're 37% down in our fundraising income. So that's, that's, that's even one part of our organization. And that means the difference for, if we put it in context for people, that makes the difference for Mary who might be living in, West Cork or Connemara or Malinhead, who can't get to a physio session because there is no public transport. She is a wheelchair user and whatever, and our branch will pay for somebody to go collect her, take her to the physio session, actually pay for the physio class that's actually being held and pay for all that activity that isn't being provided for them. Yes, so so we can't have that. So I'm trying to, to kind of be as quick as possible. No, 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 don't, don't. It's just, I, I understand it. I understand, I understand exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So that's, that's just one small piece. Then you take, I suppose, MS Ireland in our totality. And obviously we have to fundraise to provide services. So you take the Bank Holiday weekend that's just gone, the May Bank Holiday. We had World MS Day on Saturday. We would used to have um, a, a garden in bloom. We were supposed to have the mini marathon, which would probably turned around yeah. about 40,000 euro for us. How much? 40,000? Yeah, we, yeah we'd, we'd net around just, don't, well, about 40. So you take... Yeah. Take that as now that's one activity the weekend before yeah. we had the ball that we, we would have had we had 10 or 15 different activities because all those mass fundraising activities are now gone so i suppose and then you look at okay what we get money from from the state is obviously the provision of that service um by our community workers and part of our, our respite facility then you go to Matt mags's question which is what have we done so we've tried to turn our face-to-face consultations that our community workers used to have where they would go out and meet Mary in her home or in the local coffee shop into Zoom calls. So we've now translated that to we make one-to-one -one telephone calls to people. And again, if they are tech savvy, we will change that to Zoom. We've also had, um, because of the Sloan to Care funding that we received, we were looking at um, a whole area of, of doing programs for a, a mix of um, people with neurological conditions. And now in the month of May, we have turned that into actually delivering our physiotherapy programs online. So if I can give you just one example of that, we have 12 groups running, 85 people in those groups with a 70% attendance rate at the moment. We're hoping to add another 13 additional groups to that in the next week. So that will be 25 groups that we'll have up and running doing physio 
from their home with all the requisite um, health and safety issues and all of that that we need to do having covered. And that's just one example of how we've tried to change things. I'll give one more because I'm conscious of the time for others. Um, during World MS Day, one of the other things that we did was we would always have various different events uh, being run around the country. The one we had in Dublin would have been held in a hotel in city centre Dublin, whereby we would have had about 100 people sign up, probably depending on the evening, 50, 60 people turn up. On the night, we had um, a webinar and we had 734 people from all over Ireland. So it's not all, it's not all bad that, you know, what we, how we've changed our service delivery. But obviously, we have to be conscious of the fact there are a cohort of people who will never sit in front of a, a computer screen like this, um, who will want the face-to-face -face contact, who need the face-to-face -face contact, and who need our ongoing support. And I suppose we, we're trying to marry that now over, over the next few weeks. So, sorry, Meg, I, I could obviously go on for a lot longer. No, 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 I, I think they were no, fantastic no. examples, Ava. Yeah. And I think one of the things that you said, which I pick up on, is some of these things are longer term. So you gave the example of backpacking, that that's yeah. something that's not going to happen for a very long time. So I think sometimes when people are thinking of the impact, oh, you know, the marathon is cancelled and that could be rescheduled and everything will all be fine. But a lot of these things are going to impact on charity fundraising for a long time. An example of that, that's a perfect example that there's no way that any of those fundraisers will turn around in 2020. But if you take no. an example, our biggest fundraiser is the Readathon, which is a schools based reading initiative yeah. that happens in September, October, November. Now, I have in my budget that that's still going to happen. I'm trying to be optimistic about it. I'm trying to think, right, because, you know, you can't just, if, you were, if we were to take that out of the budget and I was to hand that to the board, they'd look at me and go, well, that needs to change. Our organization needs to change entirely. So I still have that in my budget. But obviously, there's going to be huge challenges for us. There's going to be huge challenges for a school who's, who's only trying to get themselves back up and running to even be involved in a fundraiser. So I, I think we... we we are saying, okay, look, from September, we'll start doing things. But I have no idea if the ball, if the ball, for example, that I've rescheduled from May till November will actually happen. Um, as I say, it's in there in a budget. And that's why I haven't said our, our fundraising budget for 2020 is zero. But whether these things will happen or not will depend on us actually from a public health perspective coming out of all the phases and all of that. Yeah. And I can see I can see Peter and Pat nodding furiously in agreement. That's very much the, the situation in their own organisations. Peter, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I mean it's 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 so similar. I mean, one of in just in terms of in to respond directly. I mean, in terms of our our own fundraising at Epilepsy Ireland, we, as I, as I said at the beginning, we're 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 very much a um community a, yeah community fundraising volunteer led fundraising um is still hugely important to us and um. Maybe one of the, the most old-fashioned forms of fundraising is vital to us, which is church gate collections, and um, uh, it's 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 probably our biggest uh, our biggest source of funding uh, from fundraising. Um, and like like backpacking and those type of events, it's really uncertain as to when those things come back. Um, and even when they do come back, obviously organisations are going to have a duty of care, obviously to our long long-term volunteers and people who put them who, who put themselves out there on, on church gates and in in shopping centres. Yeah. The other thing, sorry, it occurs to me, Peter, is people just haven't been using cash at all. No, yeah. So, you know, even when those services, when you can start holding church gate collections, are people going to have the spare change in the pocket that really amounts to such an impactful fundraise for you? Absolutely, That's actually yeah. going to be really, yeah. We've it's, had a it's, it's that. another... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it just seems so awful. You know, it's a really good point. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's on our minds. It's 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 on our minds as well. And um, you know, how can we how can we adjust now? Is, are 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 going to be opportunities there to to adjust how how collections are 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 done? Um. So we have, we also have our uh, Rose Week event, which is another big yeah. event for us in October coming up. Um. So again, it'll be the same type of issues. Um. Exactly like Ava, we've 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 kept these things, um, you know, in our budgets as coming back for the final quarter. Um, you know, whether they they come back is still unknown, still uncertain at the moment. And even if they do come back, uh, it's going to be well into 2021 before these um, kind of uh, you know a, a community fundraising events, you know, return yeah. to to full service. Uh, and of course, the other thing is that we're going to be left uh, with a. a you know, presumably a fairly significant recession at the end of all of this. Yes. Um, so people aren't going to necessarily have the cash either. And obviously, we we understand that we you know we, um, I mean that's the, you know that 
like that's just going to be another issue that organizations like ours are going to have to deal with. Okay. Pat, yeah. do, you, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I don't want to repeat again what was said, but I think mentioning the recession, Peter, just brings me back to reminding Jennifer that during the last recession, there were cutbacks year on year of over 20% it, amount, it amounted to by the time it stabilized. And so, so people were, were cut to the bone at that point and really struggling to maintain a service. And then just as we're starting to recover, we now have to deal with, um, you know, first of all, the 1% cut even was enough to start shoving people into the, into the red that we're managing. Um, so we have this on top of it. So it really is a very unstable and unsettling future at the moment. In terms of, you know, again, we, we responded similarly by, by changing a lot of events to online. Um, we've got some great people to speak in terms of um, trying to reduce people's stress levels, mindfulness, yoga, all those kinds of things we started to do online. Um, and we've noticed that the calls have started to reduce, but initially we were just run off our feet trying to, to keep up with people and the stress levels that people had. Um, so now, you know, I had a team meeting yesterday, and now we're turning our attentions to how do we um, continue to try and provide a service while trying to make up this shortfall. And that's the real, real, real struggle for us now in the coming months. I suppose I, I, for one, was was startled by the responses to the, the charity regulator survey that over half of charities were saying they were looking at, at um, financial difficulties and maybe not being able to provide a service beyond six months. But I suppose it's when you hear the stories of individual charities and the examples that you've all given, it, it, is, so, it is so clear practically on the ground when you hear the voice of the charities themselves, just how this is, is going to impact you, not just in the short term, but into the longer term as well. I, one, of the, I mean, one of the most stark fi uh, findings I've seen in, the, in these surveys was the one from the uh, Disability Federation, where they, a survey of their members found that over a third of their members um, uh, felt that they weren't going to be viable after six months. Um, and uh, I also noticed there that the wheel have estimated somewhere between 400 and 500 million euros in lost fundraising income across the sector this year. So in an overall sense, I think that's, I mean, those are two very severe numbers. Um, and I, I mean, the, the impact of that across the entire sector, not just neurological charities, but across the entire sector is going to be huge into the future. Uh, and just to pick up on, 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 on Pat's point there, um, I mean, all of the organisations here, I think, have been affected by that that one percent cut this year. And well, you know, while it sounds very small, no, it's not. I don't know. Um, it's um, it's 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 still something that uh, when you're already dealing with historic cuts uh, that haven't been replaced from back in you know 2010, 2011, 2012, when all of your costs are are increasing. Uh, except pay, um, I should I should I should point out. But when all of your costs are, are are increasing and your funding has remained static and is now entering a new phase of cuts, even before COVID, um, again it puts severe pressure on uh, the organisation to respond to people's needs, to respond, to, you know, to be flexible, to be innovative, which is the real strengths of this sector. Um, so when you're under that kind of pressure, it does make it very difficult, even when you know what. What needs to be done to improve the services and to you know meet your mission it's very difficult to do it when you're living from year to year and with that uncertainty um, hanging over you yeah. um so even even before covid that that was an ongoing issue for the sector yeah. um, and something that, that multi-annual funding framework is actually delayed plan hmm. yeah. yeah sorry Ava. If i could reference that see for me the one percent isn't about actually how much it is of course about how much it has uh, financially taken out of our 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 pot but for me what it, it's what it represents it's that it, it's 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 going back to that lack of a relationship between us as the ball and
sector and us as service providers and actually us as seen to be service providers in the sector. And for me, that's what it comes back to is that that funding model that is there with the HSE that is fundamentally flawed, that isn't um, multi-annual, that if, for example, I have 10 relationships with 10 different uh, HSE, CHO areas, you know, and it's all that fundamental issues that we have and that have been there for years. Now, obviously the Catherine Day report which obviously we're all familiar with and which obviously identifies that the whole thing about the relationship between our sector and the state. I mean, you know, that is increasingly important. We've been saying this for years and this thing of, well, we'll just implement a 1% cut with no dialogue. It doesn't make any sense. So we've implemented a 1% cut. We've taken that from us. And now then I have to make an application form to the stability fund. All this, and I echo what the, my colleagues have said, it, absolutely wonderful ideas, stability fund, it wasn't a complicated process, we have applied. But being honest about it, even if we are lucky enough to get the maximum, which is a hundred grand um, of an actual, we'll say, um, grant, it doesn't touch the surface of what it is that we will be, will be required by MS Ireland to actually be, keep ourselves now, as an organization, we have, and okay, obviously I'm biased, but we have run our organization very well. Therefore, we have the ability at the moment, because of reserves, to be stable at the moment while we don't have any fundraising income coming in. But if you add to that the fact that I handed my board a massive deficit budget last October, that's before we ever had a COVID discussion. Now I add COVID to that. You have the sustainability of all of us. And it's not, you know, it's not because we're not running our organizations really well. No, I know. Not, you know, we're not seen as a real key player in the sector. But yet, during this time, the voluntaries have continued to provide services to people with MS, with epilepsy, with migraine. We have adapted. We've changed, adapted. We, and we have turned around to continue to provide services to, to our population that we serve. So again, it's about that recognition and that engagement around, we need to be seen as a, as a key player and we need to be involved in that dialogue about how we're going to manage as organizations going forward. Yeah, I understand, I understand. It's almost, it's almost like a double standard of the reliance on the, on the voluntary and, and the charity and voluntary sector to step up in terms of COVID, in terms of supporting people. And we in the Neurological Alliance saw that across our 30 member neurological charities of a huge reliance for specialist information and support on the voluntary sector organizations. And then as, as Ava is saying, on the other side, then you're facing cuts, you're facing a lack of dialogue. And I suppose all the talk now is about services, health services reopening. We are the health services as well. Voluntary organizations are providing clinical services. They're so stitched in to the provision of neurological care that it's not possible to separate out and say, well, look, that's the clinical services and this is what the voluntaries do. They're part and parcel of it. And I say the health, the overall health of neurological care in Ireland needs to needs a strong vibrant neurological sector that is is seriously under threat now it was under threat before covid it's doubly under threat now because of, of the impact on fundraising yeah and i suppose one thing one thing that was you know very welcome in fairness was um you know early enough in the in the covid uh, pandemic hse did get in touch um you know to confirm that section 39 funded organizations you know wouldn't wouldn't have their funding touched for uh, 2020 and that you know the uh, contracts as agreed in 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 January would be honoured, and that was obviously very welcome and very appreciated. Um, you know, very appreciated. But I suppose there is a point there that you know charities like our, our uh, ourselves on, on the call here today are going to really feel the pinch next year. We're going to feel the pinch because fundraising is going to be down, as we discussed for the remainder of 2020 and into 2021, and yeah. and, and 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 also our reserves. Anyone, any charity that that has reserves are going to see those depleted over the next you know six twelve months as well. So yeah. you know what we really can't take is a, is a, is, a, is a, like a, a triple whammy of of those two things happening and they're going to happen and the HSE coming in next year to say well you know we don't have the money that we'd like to have so we're going to pass on a ten or a you know twenty percent cut on to our providers so something like that would be absolutely catastrophic um, for the certainly for epilepsy Ireland and I'm sure for good migraine and for MS Ireland as well. Yeah. So I mean, like that—that—that that, that is a very important point. I think that needs to be made. Um, and just one other thing, then, which is about uh, reserves. And maybe I'm being a little bit controversial here, but 
for uh, you know for many years we've heard a, a debate um, about whether charities should have reserves and it was considered somehow to be a negative thing to be a bad thing that a charity might have a bank account with uh, you know money in it and able to continue for six or nine months in our case we have about nine months of, of, of uh, of reserves to you know for exactly the kind of rainy day that we're facing now and if it wasn't for that we'd be looking you know we'd be looking at closing down yeah. parts of our services the entire organization so i just think that that conversation i agree um, with you I, I no i don't think it's controversial at all i mean it seems to me to be a completely prudent thing to do and so long as it's you know displayed in your annual accounts and your annual report mm-hmm. i mean what's the i mean every, people keep savings for a rainy day businesses do that why would a charity not do that i mean of course and exactly. I think the case I mean, for that I, is made even, more. Even, even more now because you can see the disruption caused by this pandemic, which is not related to your particular area of, of, of practice, of, of, of health, as it were, but it has a knock-on consequence. But, you know, it could have been um, something that impacted you more greatly than anything else, in which case reserves, you would have just simply have had to have extra cash. So I, it's not that's not an argument I, I have ever understood and I've yeah. always seen some of the, you know, in, in uh, sectors where I've worked previously, in, in government departments where I've worked previously, it has always seemed to me to be some of the best run charities are those with very, very clear accounts, with very obvious reserves. And I don't understand what the question is, but per, you know, perhaps I'm missing an argument in relation to it, but I, I don't see what the issue is. And I think it's the inconsistency as well of different requirements across different funders and different reporting arrangements and duplication. Yeah. And I know, yeah. I know that's that a small yeah. thing in the context of no, it's the... Not. It's not because anything, anything that, yeah, now, anything that creates an additional administrative burden creates additional costs. Like Ava, what you're saying there about dealing with the different CHOs and all of those, they're all administrative relationships that you need to maintain. And I get that, you know, we're not having a conversation about the structure of healthcare, the structure of HC funds, but I get the implication for you as, you know, managing the organization, trying to deliver services to people who need it, trying to maintain, you know, maintain your funding streams and then having, you know, multiple administrative relationships that are essentially replicating similar conversations in, in just the same in the same place. You know, I, I understand. Mm. And, and, and look, that's all there the report anyway. Do you know what yeah. I mean? That's yeah. already something that has Actually, been you're trying to come in there. You know, I, I, mean, I, think, I just want to reiterate what something Peter said there, that there is a major concern that, you know, the HSC can arbitrarily give a 1% cut without any kind of rationale to it. And next year could make a similar decision just to reduce um, our funding without us having any input. Without our... So I think it's important at this point that some representation is made um, on our behalf to the HSC that it isn't, uh, you know, at all appropriate to be looking at cutbacks in, in, in this sector next year. Okay. Well, I hear you very clearly. And, you know, one of the things that I'm conscious of is I am a new TD and I'm very interested in listening and learning and learning more and more about all of the different sectors that I'm talking to. Um, and I'll certainly be having, having you know, I'll certainly ask the different questions. Um, and I'm really interested and I'm really interested in being helpful in, in whatever way I can be helpful. I don't know what's going to happen with the new government or what's going to happen, you know, or, or, or at formation of a new government or what the structures are going to be or what's going to, you know, what's going to be um, in the programme for government. But, you know, look, I'm interested and I'm listening and I'm here to listen and learn. And I really am interested, you know. Yeah, no, and we really appreciate that because that's 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 just really important, obviously, from our, we're obviously incredibly passionate about what we do. Yeah. Also, ultimately, we're all here to benefit different people, whether it's a cohort of people with MS yeah. or, or, or epilepsy or migraine. But ultimately, you know, if people don't get service from us, it puts more of a, a challenge. Oh, I know. I know. I know. I know. I understand the logic entirely. No, I, I really do. I and understand. The value add piece that I think is forgotten about all the time, whatever about the service we are actually given money for to provide. But I mean, it's the value add that's put, put on that. You just like, there's no way you could actually, the state could could provide that they couldn't may i make one more point that's just on a practical note but we're all having conversations now about the roadmap to return uh, to work even though as mags has mentioned we, we've always been working you know we've just adapted our services in, in a way but what's i suppose it's quite challenging i feel at the moment and certainly i know myself and peter have had several calls with other chief executives around the onus that that now is putting on some of us uh, to open up with all these stringent requirements and then you're having uh, emails from 50 different companies telling us you know how much they could charge us for the training that we need to provide and I and they're kind of going well surely to God 
if we have our funders, which are the HSC or Pubbel or whoever it is, that there could be the training given to us by those organizations that we don't have to go out and pay fundraising. That seems completely obvious. That seems completely obvious because what you're doing is, of course, implementing HSE advice, right? Absolutely. Okay. And I have no to... difficulty raising that directly today for you. That seems completely obvious. Expecting... I do not understand why you would have to expend money on that. There has to be something that can be rolled out to us that we that can yeah. be a standard practice that we do not have to start reinventing the wheels. I mean, thank you, Peter. Thank you very last week that I was able to adapt but it's madness so there's no and so what you what I would ask you to do is could you could you email that to me could you email me that point and I will absolutely take that up today and and, and make that point very clearly and you know with the minister and publicly as well it seems obvious I don't um, Mag, there's no issue with that coming from NAI sure they wouldn't because that's irrelevant not at all not at all Eva. It's, a, it's a really really good point and it's very much that this is our experience it's, it's, there's a set of rules and regulations being handed to organizations as service providers but very little on the other side in terms of back Okay. Yeah. And again, we're the small. It just seems, yeah, it just seems like that you're creating a need there. Whereas, in fact, you know, if you're actually implementing the HSE advice and you have a statutory relationship with them already, as well as a funding relationship, that this seems like an obvious link. And may I give credit where it's due? Like, we are now involved in calls on different days with different CHO areas where, you know, you, we, the voluntary sector have been invited into those calls. Okay basis so you have to give credit where it's due there is a lot of that that's very positive there are things that have changed in two months that would have taken two years or never you know in, in because of COVID but I think what we're forgetting is we're not we're not the bigger players and I am part of the Disability Action Coalition which is which is a group of bigger organizations and I'm part of that but us here at the table we're not the bigger players we don't have our own HR staff members we don't have an operations manager that can roll out whichever but we are still very significant contributors to the provision of service so there yeah. must be something that we can we can also be given but anyway that's uh, but Mag uh, will will make that point you're going to contact me about it. in your experience I suppose when HICWA regulations have been rolled out over the years it's it's been the same thing of the of the sector having to be compliant with yeah. new standards but having very little supports in terms of putting those in place okay okay and look, I know, look, thank you so much, all of you, for, for the discussion today. I, I'm going to bring it to a close because I think there's been so much there in terms of the impact on the sector. And I suppose not just now because of COVID, but this was another wave on top of a sector that was already struggling with funding deficits, with repeated funding cuts. So it's, it's hit a sector that's already been struggling. And I suppose anything that is done to address COVID must be longer term in, in terms of supporting and, and sustaining the voluntary sector going forward as an integral part of the delivery of neurological care services in Ireland. And I'd like to thank all of our participants today and Deputy Carol McNeil, I thank you so much for listening. Thanks. And uh, we feel we've got a very valuable ally in you going forward of understanding these issues and um, conveying them in, in your work as, as a TD and your work on the, on the COVID committee in, in the shorter term. Sure. Well, we, you know, it was something that we discussed today um, just about, I think I was saying it to you separately, Mags, just about the underlying conditions can exacerbate the impact of the illness, you know, respiratory problems or heart, but indeed there are um, underlying conditions that can increase your likelihood of getting it as well, which I think needs to be thought more seriously about um, if we're if it is that we're going to be living with this for, for whatever length of time, you know, and so people who are vulnerable or increasingly in, at an increased vulnerability of contracting it, people with dementia or other neurological conditions that make it more difficult for them to process or retain information or create moments of vulnerability that other people may not have, I think it's very, very important. So I would raise that with Dr. Navarro today um, from the World Health Organization and he completely agreed. So I think it's just something to be to, to flag and I think it's important as well from a social perspective that people are respectful and kind uh, where, you, where you know um, not everybody is able to, to process and information in the same way and act in the same way and, and I think it's just very important to, to remember. Yeah absolutely and I mean these are the kind of things as our theme for World Brain Day on July 22nd is all about COVID-19 the impact. What we're doing today in terms of, of this video is, is exploring the impact on neurological charities but we've got a range of initiatives coming up looking at the impact on carers, looking at and the impact on people with neurological conditions and, and how various groups of the neurological community are going to be impacted by COVID and as you say some people at greater risk, some people having needs around the, their, their invisible disability so they're standing in a queue yeah 
yeah. and people don't recognize that person as a neurological condition and they're actually more vulnerable. So they're, yeah. as I say, they're, they, the effects and the implications for the neurological community are very significant. And the, just one of them today we wanted to look at, which is very important. Sure, sure. Of, of course it is. Yes, of course it is. Yeah. And, yeah. and of course, just, just to follow that, I mean, the other big thing that, again, we didn't unfortunately get to, to uh, touch on read today, but from a, from a sort of, you know, from a services point of view that the, our organizations are, are providing, um, you know, there's uh, like just this week, there was a, a new paper published um, amongst a group of, of uh, it was a, a study of over 250 people with epilepsy uh, compared um, you know, during the uh, COVID pandemic, uh, you know, uh, compared to controls and all the rest of it, uh, it found um, a far, a far higher level of cycle uh, of, um, psychological distress in the epilepsy population than it did in uh, in the general population and uh, found people were you know for example paying far more attention to covid related news and um i mean one of the I mean, one of the recommendations from the um, from that study was around uh, the need for care providers to focus more on um you know kind of self-management and psychological interventions and of course that's something that all of our organizations are, are particularly experienced and, and, and skilled in in terms of providing that educational and that you know, self-management support um and it's you know it's like some of the issues that we've had at epilepsy are and have been quite uh, significant over the last couple of months uh, in in that context and in fact our one-to-one -one work has actually increased by about 15 percent uh, since march um, really? yeah i, I think now, that obviously is obviously a lot of our community-based uh, supports and services and events they've all been cancelled but the actual one-to-one -one nature of it it's it's been moved as as Ava said earlier ours has also obviously been moved to phone and to email and to zoom um but it's actually gone up on average of about 15 percent each week um um well i know i've been one of the beneficiaries of it i put in a call uh where i haven't for a long time so thank you very much i appreciate it you know and it's so it's so, it's so, it's so important for you know somebody like me as the, the parent of an epileptic child to be able to make a phone call and put my mind at ease and stop worrying about a thing or to get more information about a thing whatever it happens to be so i can completely see how that would have happened and if it happened there it's going to happen in so many other places too i understand that but um but it's it, it's very interesting thank you for highlighting that to me and uh i you know in to talk to you about it separately as well yeah great and I, and I think the charities are being so modest and almost dismissive of the efforts sometimes that they've made during COVID. Oh, yes, we moved a couple of services online, but what they've done has absolutely been tremendous. And we've yeah. seen that in our survey, a recent survey we did of over 600 people with neurological conditions and their families, where there was a huge reliance on voluntary sector organizations. And I think that really is the sum message of today's call, that they've never been more needed. And unfortunately, they've, they've never been under more threat. Okay. Well, thank you for talking okay. to me about it. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks to you, Jennifer, as well. Thanks very much thank for you. all your support.